Hello again, everybody. Well, welcome to part nine of my FE examination preparation program. In this particular lesson, I'm going to be talking about professional practice, general rules of the road of becoming a professional engineer, with FE being the first step, and then talking about the ethics and the ethics policies that the NCES has and also that uh, the state individual boards have to regulate professional engineers. Okay, on the screen now is the actual agenda that we are up to at this point. The last video completed part eight, and in this video we're going to be covering what I originally designed as part nine, the licensing and ethics. This will be actually video number 13, however, if you're following along. After this, there's really only one more part to do, and that's gonna be a sample test that I'm gonna to do to try to simulate the real exam. I'm gonna limit you in time, it's gonna extend for the time that would be equal to the 2.909 seconds for all of the questions that I provide, and we'll see how it goes. That may actually be two videos because I will probably want to have a second video with the answers and the results and some motivation going forward. Every FE exam has questions that are related to ethics and licensure. That's professional practice and, and how to get your license and how to retain your license going forward. There are between two and eight questions on the test, depending on which discipline you choose and, of course, which variation of the test that they actually provide you with the day of the test. They can be true-false. I mean, you still have to answer the four answers, but they usually make it so that two of them are more true and two of them are more false, and then you have to distinguish between them. The topics included in this particular section of my course cover all of the components that you may see during the test, which includes the code of ethics, licensure itself, agreements and contracts, ethical and legal considerations, professional ethical and legal responsibility, professional liability, professional skills, talk about that a little bit more, public protection, safety, and welfare, which should actually be the top one on the list, but I left them in the order in which the actual specifications for the FE exam present them. And then, of course, regulations. And every different sp specific discipline has different regulations to it. And then finally, the NCES modal law and modal rules. These are rules that the NCES has established, which pretty much all 50 states go along with in terms of how you should conduct yourself as a professional engineer. Now, I do want to talk about the key thing for studying this material, and that is the various learning sources that you have available to you. In the actual FE reference manual, pages 3 to 10 in the new version 9.5, you should see all of this information. Let me just bring this up on the screen here and, and scan through it. And as you can see, it's all reading. There's not a lot of formulas. Actually, there's no formulas in it at all. The material that you have to study is mostly rote memorization. You have to understand the concepts, though, and try to keep the concepts in focus as you go through this. The second source is the PPI manuals, which is now owned by Kaplan, from what I understand. But I would suggest that you get those manuals. They're kind of hard to find in hard copy these days, but they're still being sold. You may have to get the electronic version of it and go through it on, you know, on your computer with a PDF reader. And then finally, your state licensing websites. There is good material out there, which I'll talk about in much detail as we get further into this. And then finally, the Internet itself. And that includes the YouTube, which hopefully you're watching this on my channel right now and other websites that are available to you that provide some information on this. So I suggest you spend some time Googling the various topic and see what you come up with in terms of additional study materials. It's constantly changing. Now the FE reference manual. This should be considered your primary source of information on these topics because this is what they draw a lot of the questions from or at least the concepts for those questions. However, just keep in mind there is no time to read this during the test. So please read those several pages and read them multiple times because you just have to understand it. 
The questions aren't that hard if you really just think about the priority of the topics they're talking about. And really, I doubt any of the questions that you'll encounter during the test will be something you'll be able to do a search for through that reference manual during the test. So don't expect to be able to just pick a keyword and search for it from a question and find the answer. I really doubt that you'll be able to find that. I am quite certain you won't. Make sure you read through this section, as I said, multiple times, and I mean multiple, two, three, four times. I mean, spread it amongst your other study material and cover it more than once, as I've indicated earlier in this program. The PPI manual. I suggest you read through the sections, and there are three sections, as I recall, that cover this material within the PPI manual, at least for the electrical and computer that I had. It slightly changes depending on which discipline manual you get, but the basic material is all the same. They also have some very good sample questions and problems that they've given you on this topic, and it helps you if maybe not find a direct answer to a question you'll see on the test, but at least helps you understand how to piece the concepts together. And of course, there's a quiz in there as well, the quiz right at the front of that major section to the manual that covers this general topic. Please go through that. I did it, but I did it after I studied the material first, although PPI manuals suggest a reverse order of that. Now, your state licensing board. Other than the actual REFI reference manual, this is probably the one that you'll find most interesting. On your state licensing board, you'll see a number of different things. So I suggest you read through the material they provide, and I'll show you that in a couple of minutes. And you'll be able to see that it is quite helpful in terms of preparing you for this material. After all, they're the ones that are setting the law on this. Now they follow NCEES guidelines in creating some of that, but they all have their own flavor to it. So I suggest you do read through it. Now let me show you an online example of this for New York State, which is the licensing board that applied to me. If I go to the New York State website, it's called the Office of the Professionals. It's right here, jumps right out of the first choice. But where I'm interested in going right now is to a specific section on professional engineers. The New York State licensed professionals overall, which include doctors, dentists, and everybody else. But let me pick the one on professional engineers, engineering. And in the engineering section, there is a specific one for engineering versus land surveying. So let's go into the engineering one. And over here, they have all of the forms that you can print out to submit to get the approval, specifically for the PE exam in most cases. I do want to point out something here there is a continuing PE continuing education ethics self-study course on the New York State website. I would suggest you go there and take a look at it. This gives you an introduction, but it gives you this test. Now, this test is something that will earn you one professional engineering credit. Now, you need 36 of them in New York, every state is different, in order to renew your license. You also don't have to do this your first cycle or the first three years of your registration, but every three years after that, you're going to need those 36 credits. If you take the time to go through this test and answer it, and what's interesting about this is you can pick the answers and then at the bottom you say get your score. So let me pick one right now, I'll just randomly pick a couple of answers here and I'll say get my score. Believe it or not, I didn't even read the question and I got 15% correct. This doesn't get submitted to New York State online. What you're expected to do is after you've completed this test and you get the required score, and they tell you here what the required score is in order for it to count for a CPE, 90%. You've got to get a score of 90% on this quiz. But there's no rule against you trying multiple times until you get the 90%. And then once you get the 90%, then print this out, have a copy of it ready. This goes into your records and you claim this hour when you are going to renew after the period of time of your registration that requires CPEs to renew. This is in case they audit you. You'll have this record proven that you actually took the test. But in addition to the test, I also suggest, well, further down in here is the actual law within New York State that governs all license. It's a little bit difficult to read, but if you go through this, it's the first choice here, you can actually read all of the different title laws 
that New York State has on it. Now, even if you're in a different state, this may be useful to you because a lot of the states mimic the same laws when it comes to professional engineers. They are very close. There's a couple of outliers, but I think the majority of them tend to be in line on this material. Professional practice. I'm going to cover in this section uh, agreements and contracts, professional liability, usually a tort or civil action is what they call professional liability, which means it's settled in civil court, not criminal court. Although you can get criminal charges if you go ahead and violate certain of the rules as the law for the, your state dictates. And then of course, protection of intellectual property. That's a key one that you need to understand what that means. Contracts. There are two basic types of material that need to be in a contract. The section on the left I have is the mandatory sections. They include, of course, your name and the address or parties involved. Now, they don't have to be personal addresses. They could be your corporate addresses. And you need the signatures and dates that you sign this, a description of all duties and obligations within the contract, the fee amount. And this is important to understand. There has to be a fee. And I'll talk about quip pro quo later because that's critical to have a legal contract. Effective and expiration dates. Those are two different dates. One is the contract start and basically one does it end. Those dates should be in there. And boilerplate clauses. Now there's a lot of boilerplate clauses out there. I'm not going to go through them all. The PPI manual talks about some of them in quite a bit of detail. I think you should know that as a professional engineer. I'm not sure how helpful that is, though, to get into that detail for the FE exam. Some of the boilerplate would be, you know, the fact that uh, an act of God could cause you not to meet the agreement, right? There's an actual uh, Latin term for that that I'll mention later. Then there's the optional section. The optional sections include an introduction or a preamble, deadlines and any required service dates, declaration of authority. You have to describe unless you're the actual person doing it. So if it's one of your agents or one of your employees, even a lawyer, you have to declare that within the contract that they have the authority to sign for you. And that's what that means. The fee schedule and payment terms. That's more detail on the fees. Optional, but it gives you the ability to enforce the fact that, you know, you're going to get paid, let's say, one quarter of it after the first three months and so forth. Any supporting documents. A supporting document would be, let's say, reference to other components of the contract. Maybe the qualification statement, such as the people you are hiring are professional engineers. Well, that should be defined on how you want to take care of that and whether you'll accept engineers that are in a different jurisdiction. Understanding, of course, that if it requires a PE stamp on the final design, then you can't use somebody outside your jurisdiction. And then subcontracts, and of course that would only apply if you actually have subcontract. So usually it's a master contractor, if it's a large engagement, and they have other subs that work for them. And so you can request, and I suggest you do, that they include all those subcontracts that they've set up with those third parties within your major agreement. Now these are some legal terms, I already mentioned a couple of them, but these are the actual definitions. Most of them are derivations from Latin. These are things that every lawyer knows and you're going to see terms like this in boilerplate if nothing else. So you need to understand what they mean. Force majeure, and that means except for an act of God. Quip pro quo, that means in exchange for or doing something and getting something. You can't have a contract that's one way. No court will consider that contract valid. You can't write a contract uh, that says this person is going to do something for you and that's it. You don't give them anything in return for that. That will not be enforceable in court by any means. Expo facto. Now it doesn't apply too much for upfront contracts, but you have to understand this applies to the overall concept of contracting. It's also in the law primarily for criminal activities. Nobody can change a law after the fact. You can't change a rule or a law after the act has taken place. So you can't write a contract, for example, that says you're going to meet a particular deadline that passed six months ago and then try to hold them to that. That's not going to make any sense at all. And any lawyer will f argue this and win on the expo facto concept. 
tort is just another term for civil, not criminal law. So if it's something that would only take place in a civil court, then it's considered tort. Now, tort is a strange thing. It's usually not written down in all of its details about you know, what the judges are gonna follow in making their judgments. They tend to base it upon precedent. So if you have a case that took place in civil court and one decision was determined by three other lawyers and they can see that in the record of other cases, then it's unlikely that the new lawyer for the new one that's maybe exactly the same as one or more of those, that they'll suddenly make a different judgment on it. That's called something that's in tort law as a result of previous cases. Well, this lesson nine is taking considerably more than I thought it would in terms of actual time. I apologize, but I need to split this into two videos. So hopefully I'll be able to get that up in the next day or so and you can continue right where we left off. Again, I do apologize, and I would like you to consider, if you've gotten anything out of this, at least the first video of this lesson, you'd consider subscribing to my channel. It would really be helpful. Thank you.